So I saw this game for sale on Steam the other week for a dollar. It had the words hack and net in the title, so of course I had to grab it and immediately jumped in to try it out. Seven hours of play later. And side note here, I would love it if more games could be completed in less than eight hours. Seriously, every game doesn't need to be a 40 plus hour epic marathon. I've got a day job and a family as priorities for my time. I've also got a growing backlog of games I assure myself I'll play one day. Maybe when I retire. So anyways, seven hours of concise and satisfying gameplay later, I can genuinely report I had a great time. Hacknet takes the player back to the internet of the 1990s, to an era when the internet was primarily populated with hobbyists and academics. We were like ham radio enthusiasts, a tight-knit, small community of folks united by common interests instead of the enormous, watered-down online social networks we have today. In the 2015 game Hacknet, you take the role of a hacker using a Linux operating system. You're a script kitty, someone who collects malicious software that you find on other hackers' computers that allow you to crack different ports on other systems. Hacking runs are a combination of obtuse puzzles and thorough investigations. Servers have locks on their ports, and you have to find the right keys in the form of executables to open those locks. Investigating servers is an exercise in finding the clues that are the signals in the noise of personal messages, working documents, file headers, and internet relay chat logs, which I discovered is a technology people are still using over 30 years later. Eventually, you'll join a hacker group and start taking procedurally generated contracts. These adventures range from humorous to deeply disturbing. One outing has you hacking fast food chain CFC's servers to get a hold of the seven herbs and spices recipe. Another will have you hacking a hospital database to get a hold of a patient's sensitive medical records. Or deleting records from a death row database or hacking someone's pacemaker to assist in their suicide. Each contract you complete improves your reputation with the group, and members will share new tools to unlock more ports and help you tackle more advanced adventures. I found the game intellectually challenging. I learned a lot, googled a lot, and found the hacking programs you use in the game are often based on real-life hacks from over the years. At the core of everything is porthack.exe. It exploits open ports to grant the hacker admin rights to the victim's computer. But first, you have to get those ports open and listening for porthack to work. Port 22 is for the SSH protocol, which allows secure connections between computers over the network. For this, you'll use the sshcrack.exe to execute a brute force attack on the port to open it up. I found this GitHub project claiming to perform a brute force attack on SSH. It sounds like this could work, but would likely take a long time and your IP address would probably get banned for too many bad login attempts. On port 21, we have the FTP protocol, used for file transfers, and in Hacknet, you'll use the ftpbounce.exe program to request access to ports. This is based on the FTP bounce attack, which modern FTP server programs are protected against. SMTP, used for sending emails, runs on port 25, and you will use the smtpoverflow.exe program to open this port. Buffer overflows are a hacking technique that's been around forever. Attacks involve sending arguments to the protocol or software that are longer than it can accept. This causes an overflow error and could grant you access to the system. A very basic example of this could be a password input that can only accept 10 characters, where the hacker inputs enough characters to create an overflow and bypass the login screen. Programs don't fall for these kinds of attacks anymore, but it's good to know the principle. For the HTTP protocol on port 80, used for surfing the web, we have the webserverworm.exe program. Worms can also use overflows to break software and allow themselves to propagate through the system. Two famous computer worms are the Code Red computer worm from 2001, which infected Microsoft IIS servers, as well as the Sasser computer worm, which exploited Windows operating systems through a vulnerable port. In Hacknet, when a computer is running a SQL server on port 1433, you can use SQL memcorrupt.exe, which uses a SQL injection attack to insert a corrupt record to the hosted database and cause it to crash. 
SQL injection attacks are still a problem today and one many organizations have to stay alert for. If a hacker can find a way to sneak a SQL argument into a form or a URL query string, they can execute SQL commands directly against the database. HackNet also has pretend hacks for proxies and firewalls, and hacks for proprietary technologies that only exist in the game, which you have to figure out how to hack using information you get hacking the companies that make them. Now, keep in mind, hacking doesn't actually work like this, but this simplified, script kitty version of hacking is fun for the purposes of gameplay. My favorite hacking program in the game is one you kind of have to discover yourself. It's forkbomb.exe. This is a process that replicates itself until the computer running it completely crashes. I used to sometimes send fork bombs to friends as a prank and even used it in a class where I had students open a fork bomb on their own computers. What you see here is the code for one that can run on Windows. You can put this code in a .bat file and execute it, but I don't recommend that. I did so, and I'm happy to report that Windows 11 will still completely crash if you execute this file. Your computer will completely lock up. And you will get a blue screen of death. And in my case, my BIOS even thought there was a hardware failure and made me run safety checks on everything before it would let me boot up again. Now that everything is fine, I can say it was cool, but it was a little scary at the time. There's a definite educational value to HackNet. Playing this game, I was reminded of when a systems engineer coworker once complained to me about employees who didn't understand the systems they were working on. How do they work at a Linux terminal for 10 years and never think to ask what it is they're working with, he told me. I don't get it. As computers become more and more abstracted, users grow more and more removed from understanding how our information systems work. We erroneously equate the term internet with World Wide Web, or hear the names of protocols but don't know what they are. HackNet takes us back to a time when we were working further down the abstraction stack. The command line is still an abstraction, but the graphical point-and-click interface Windows provided made computers far more accessible. Linux commands can seem cryptic in comparison. CD for change directory, LS for list files, and RM for remove files are not intuitive, but they are highly convenient once you learn the interface and it makes sense that you would want to type out an abbreviated command rather than a fully descriptive one over and over again. In fact, my friends and I avoided using Windows for years after it came out because point and click was so much less efficient than working in the command line. Even today, knowing keyboard shortcuts can save you having to reach for the mouse over and over again. HackNet illustrates the efficiency of keyboard over mouse really well by allowing users to interact with the system via either strictly keyboard or a hybrid of keyboard and mouse. Players who like to minimax will practice working with the keyboard as much as possible to quickly navigate the systems. It's also imperative to know the command line in the game. One time, a hacker got revenge on me for stealing a file from their computer. They deleted the GUI interface file from my computer. I then had to use pure command lines to hack back into their computer, download their GUI interface file, restore it on my computer, and reboot to restore the graphical interface. This reliance on the command line can present a serious challenge to players lacking basic typing skills. Most commands involve typing a few letters and then hitting tab to autocomplete. But if the player is a hunt and peck typist, then they aren't going to be able to complete some of the challenges. In addition to memorizing Linux commands, the game rewards memorizing the ports for SSH, SQL, HTTP, as well as the attacks you use against each one. So if I know SSH is always on port 22, I can run the command SSH crack 22 without having to look it up each time. This memorization becomes imperative later on when you start hacking servers that initialize traces against you, memorizing your tools and the ports they apply to as well as managing your local RAM so you can run more processes in parallel are crucial to beating the trace clock. I think working with so many different ports really illustrates that the internet is so much more than just web pages. The HTTP protocol running on port 80 and HTTPS running on port 443 serve us the World Wide Web, but we also have SMTP serving emails on port 25, FTP for file transfers on port 21, and the Internet of Things using a variety of ports for communications. As you can see in this cheat sheet of protocols, the internet is much more than just the World Wide Web. And, as silly as it sounds, some folks don't know the World Wide Web runs on the internet. 
Another potentially educational aspect of Hacknet is the way it was written. The game directory is full of XML files defining the content of the missions and the computers hosting them. There's a save file cataloging everywhere you've gone and all your accomplishments. According to the forums, editing this XML file should change details in the game. But that didn't work for me, like when I tried to add some folders to my personal computer because the make directory command doesn't exist in the game. But nothing happened. But the files are full of interesting details if you want to explore them. After beating the game, I went through and found account names with passwords to access systems for fun that I was too lazy to properly hack in the game. Likewise, don't sweat it if you get stuck in the game and find yourself having to check the game forums for hints. That's just like real life. Working in IT is all about collaboration. It's all too complex and requires too much accuracy for anyone to completely go it alone. Also, I was really impressed with the forums. Posters didn't give answers to questions, but gave players hints as to where they could find the answers, and I really appreciated that. While I do think there's a lot of educational value to this game, be warned that there's also a lot of juvenile humor as well. There are a lot of inappropriate jokes about sex and drugs, mostly pulled directly from bash.org, and I know educators can't use this game in the classroom for this reason. In closing, I really enjoyed Hacknet. While the hacking isn't real, it's fun to play pretend. It was a brief, cheap, and engaging game that took me back to my college days of surfing the internet via command line. If this sparks your curiosity, I can definitely recommend this indie game for these reasons. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.